hold on in an evil world where there's a lot of suffering is to know that God is purifying our faith and he is making us like gold, so to speak. And the scriptures talk about how uh, God says he's like the, the, the goldsmith who sits over the gold in the pot, you know, and that he uh, oversees it. And he makes sure that it's not too hot. He makes sure it's perfected. And that's what we need to keep in mind as believers. And, and the goldsmith would constantly be taking the pure impurities that would rise to the top out of the gold as it was melting. Until, and he would look at his reflection. And he'd see his reflection, but he would see you know, these spots, you know, and these blemishes, and he'd take these, you know, impurities out that, that marred his reflection until he saw a perfect reflection of himself. And it's interesting because the Lord is making us into his image, amen? And he's taking out those things which, which uh, aren't like him, which are evil and insidious and, and things. And now, a lot of times those, those things only come out when you go through a radical trial. Isn't that heavy? You find out who you really are uh, and what's really inside when you go through a trial. Right? Isn't that true? Okay, if you, if you knock over vinegar, I've talked about that before, what's it going to smell like? Vinegar, you know? If you knock over, you know, some uh, perfume or cologne, it's going to smell like perfume or cologne. But when you get knocked over, when you're in a trial and you get knocked over, what's in your heart will come out. And if you go through a trial and you lose it, and... Uh, you just you're really harsh and mean spirited and, and venomous and you're using bad language and, and you're you're doing mean things and you're being spiteful to other people. That's showing what's deep down inside that God wants to get out and, and He's using using that trial very often to say, Hey, look at what you need to deal with. You're not like my son right now. And I'm trying to make you like my son. I'm I'm using my spirit, I'm using my my word, I'm using my chastening, my discipline, I'm using my people, I'm using my love which brings you to repentance. I'm using all these things to purify you, but I'm using trials to let you know, God bless you, I'm using trials to let you see who you are and who you're not to be and what you should be becoming. So God will use trials in our lives and use the evil around us and the suffering to show us where our hearts are at so we can get a glimpse of the changes that need to take place in our lives. Isn't that true? How many of you found that, man, when I go through a really hard time, you know, God's shown me that what areas he needs to deal with my life in. And... Anybody? I saw a couple hands go up. Anybody? I'll raise my hand. You know, you know. But you know what? And at, at the same time, we get man, you know, wretched man that I am. We stay at those moments, right? But God wants that to become less and less in our lives. Did you know that? Then want to become more and more. And as we're following Christ, that should become less and less in our lives. Now, if we start getting away from the Lord, and we're not seeking Him as we ought, uh, then you know that purification process isn't happening as it should be happening. And we need to get back on our knees. And we need to seek God more and, and, and let him do his work in our hearts. So, so keep in mind, uh, it's through trials and it's through suffering, it's through these kinds of things that God shows us who we are. I mean, it's pretty heavy when you look at Jesus, right? He went through more anguish than anyone, right? When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's going through hematidosis and he's sweating as it is great drops of blood uh, because his blood vessels, capillaries are are popping in his head because of the anguish. And those he's going to die for are, are sleeping, you know. Uh, it, it would be very easy for any of us to lose it, you know, because he's very, Jesus is very fatigued and tired of the time. And, he, you know, he could have got very upset and said, I'm not dying for you guys. I can't believe you won't even pray with me for an hour. But he says, he says, can't you just, he let, tells him the truth in love. Can't you just pray one hour with me, you know. And he's on the cross, man. That was horrifying what he went through. And, you know, he could have called legions of angels. He could have said, I'm getting down from here. You know, it's just it's ain't worth it. But what came out of Jesus was pure love when he was in the harshest and hardest trial that we can't even comprehend going through because that's all that was in Jesus. Amen? There was no evil in him. Pure love. Pure righteousness. And guess what? We're called when we suffer to respond the same way that he, he, he responded. It's like, wait, well, what can, how, how can that happen? I mean... You know, we're human. It can happen because guess who lives in us? Jesus lives in us, amen? And Jesus manifests his life in us and through us when we go through trials. And that means we need to constantly pray to be yielded over to him. And there's that constant temptation to take things into our own hands. And then we operate according to the flesh. It only brings destruction and death and, and a stench into our lives. And so let's seek to allow the goldsmith 
to purify us and take the blemishes out as he heats things up. And when you see something in your life that's not right or reaction that's wrong, you need to pray about that right away. Say, God, please take that from me. Please. I tell the story when I was first a Christian, man. I was a Christian just a, a, a few months, and I was witnessing to my family members, and none of them knew Jesus. And a couple of them were, you know, uh, pretty harsh at that time. We were all teenagers, you know, coming to Christ. And I was the only one in Christ and trying to witness him. And I remember sometimes a couple of my family members would just get really loud, you know, when we talked about sin and dealing with it and, and coming to the Lord, you know. And I remember the first couple of times I was witnessing, you know, I was right there with them, man. We had our typical shimmel argument, you know, uh, where we just all were getting into it or we'd get into it. And I remember it's like I'd leave that situation and say, wait a minute, man. God would convict me and say, Joe, you're not supposed to be communicating the way they're communicating now. You know, you're following me now. And I'm not saying we were like, ah! But it was just back and forth, the same kind of harshness. For, you know, just getting upset, getting defensive and going back and forth. And I remember going in my room, getting on my knees and saying, God, take that from me. Take, don't, don't let me respond the way they respond and help me love them, even though they're responding that way. And I saw him change my life that way. I'm far from perfect, just like we all are, but there's a consistency in my life now to where the Spirit of God uh, is at work and operating when I go through those hard times because I'm yielding myself over daily to him. And so are you. Those of you who are believers are doing the same thing. doesn't mean that you're perfect or any of us are close, but it means there should be a big difference from when we first got saved. Amen? And we should see the, you know, the fruit of the Spirit and the joy of the Lord and things like that in our lives. And another thing we can keep in mind, since God is all-powerful, uh, if now this is the way I see it, man, is God is so much more radical than the atheist or agnostic can even imagine. In fact, I was talking to uh, someone dear to me some years back uh, who said, you know, my God is so big, Joe, so much bigger than your God, my concept of God, a guy I was witnessing to, he says that he's not even aware that we exist, you know. And I said, no, I said, no, no, man, my God is so much bigger than that, that he knows each person that exists, he sees our thoughts, he knows every hair on our heads, and he's concerned about us and cares about us. That's a much bigger concept of God, isn't it? That he could keep in mind billions of people and even watch the little sparrow that falls to the ground with concern when there's trillions of birds, you know? It's mind-boggling, isn't it? That's a much bigger God, and that's the God of the Bible. In fact, God is so powerful, and he's so good, and he's so wise that he could use the evil that fallen angels and that humans engage themselves in. And in his almighty power, he can use that evil and turn it to a good outcome. And he can use uh, uh, evil decisions made by evil beings and use it for his glory in the end. In fact, the Bible says that God uses the wrath of man or causes the wrath of man to praise him. And we're all familiar with Romans 8, 28, the favorite verse of some people, of many people. It's been their favorite verse down through the centuries. God works all things together for the what? For the good, for those who love him and who are the called according to his purpose. And then, of course, the next verse, verse 29, those whom he foreknew, he, conform, he, uh, he, can, uh, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So God's working everything for the good, for the, those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And we know, now that's powerful. That means God is all good, but he's also all powerful, and he's using everything, including evil, for the ultimate good outcome. And that's what I was saying. The whole question as to how God could be all good and all powerful and allow evil is based on certain unfounded premises that are not, in, uh, that are not truthful. And the scriptural uh, truth is that he uses evil in his uh, infinite goodness and in his infinite power for his good and for the good of those who love him or for his glory and for the good of those who love him uh, in the end. In fact, you guys, we were together when we went through the book of Genesis. What person in the book of Genesis went through just about as much evil as anybody's ever gone through? Anybody remember him? What was his name? He went through, not, not Job, another guy who went through tremendous evil as we studied the book of Genesis. Joseph. Now everybody's saying Joseph. Right on. Now what did Joseph say after he was sold into slavery, after he was betrayed by his brothers, and, you know, and just treated despicably and falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison and all kinds of horrendous things. You know the story. What did he say when his brothers came to him? He says, what you guys have meant for evil, God has meant for what? God has meant for good. Now that's something we need to remember. Because God is all good and because God is all powerful, he can use what others mean for evil against us for good in our lives. 
And do you accept that? Do you, do you believe that? You need to live like you believe that instead of going around worrying from day to day.